views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello everyone and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host Darren Jaime and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough plus across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we'll speak with the New York State Senator of the 27th Senatorial District, Brad Hoyman, who will talk about the new legislation that he passed to help the community. Also, we'll sit down with the attorney and host of today's verdict, David Lesh. He'll talk about how nursing homes have responded to COVID-19 and the rights of the individuals and their families. Plus, WFUV sits in with their not-for-profit organization that's actually using pizza to raise money. We'll learn more details a little later on in the show. And then later, we'll learn about an organization that's striving to improve the quality of life for special needs families and how they're helping families also during COVID-19. And then finally, small businesses across the five boroughs have been affected by COVID-19. We'll learn how Denny Moe's Superstar Barbershop is dealing during this pandemic. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. And hello, everyone, and today is Wednesday, May 27th. I'm Darren Jaime, and you're watching Open, a live program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV sets. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on MNN's channel. And then we also want to encourage you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms. How do you do that? Well, all you've got to do is go to BronxNet TV. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through this past week, We'll take you through some of these things with our Bronx updates. New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo issued a new statewide executive order. The order now allows any gathering of up to 10 people as long as social distancing guidelines are followed. The order permits any non-essential gathering of 10 or fewer individuals for any lawful purpose or reason, provided the social distancing protocols and cleaning and disinfection protocols required by the Department of Health are adhered to. The law also legalizes small gatherings such as indoor house parties, outdoor barbecues, picnics, and mini protests, as long as there are no more than 10 people sharing in the activity. The governor still urges New Yorkers to wear mask as well as use caution and follow the social distancing rules he says quote if you don't have to be with a group of 10 people don't be with a group of 10 people end quote also in the news the governor also making headlines announcing the launch of the 100 million dollar new york forward loan program providing flexible and affordable loans to help small businesses the governor stated small businesses are the engine of new york's economy but they're now facing some of the toughest challenges in this pandemic. The loan program will focus on supporting small businesses who are less likely to receive federal loans, especially women and minority-owned businesses, small businesses with 20 or fewer employees, and businesses with more, or I should say, less than $3 million in gross revenue. Well, turning to education news now, as far as education is concerned, there will be no in-class summer school in New York State. The state announced classes will be conducted virtually, reducing the possible spread of the coronavirus. The governor also warned it is too soon to decide whether schools will resume in the fall. The state will issue guidelines in June so that schools and colleges can start to plan for a number of scenarios. After that, school districts will need to submit their reopening plans to the state for approval in July. And of course, Bronx that will continue its coverage 
of the coronavirus and all its affected parties right here on Open. Well, that's all we have for our Bronx update. Stay with us. We do have more Open coming up right after this. Back here to open, Darren Jaime here with you. So glad to have you sharing with us as we continue to bring you the news, the information, and the things that you need to know as COVID-19 continues to affect New Yorkers all across our five boroughs. When we talk about uh, the five boroughs, when we talk about New York City and state, one of the greatest challenges uh, that really a lot of people are facing in this time is dealing with PPE. Our next guest, front and center, boots on the ground in dealing with that and also making sure that the residents of his community are well represented. We are pleased to have Brad Hoyleman, who's the New York State Senator of the 27th District. And Senator, good to have you. Nice to see you, Darren. And thank you, and thanks so much for hanging with us. Listen, um, talk to us first of all, and give us a little bit of an overview about how your district is doing amidst all that's going on. Well, I think um, like every borough, uh, we've been hit really hard. Uh, but not as hard as, frankly, the Bronx or, uh, or Queens or, or, or Brooklyn. Um, I think that what we're seeing, though, in my district is mass unemployment and a real lack of housing security because tenants are unable to make their rent, whether they're commercial or residential. So we're seeing in Manhattan, after we had the initial wave of infections, a real economic stressful time for many of my constituents. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know it's a real stressful time. I know restaurants are actually doing some things to try to take the stress off of uh, some of the workers who are essential during this time, particularly for takeout and delivery. Uh, your thoughts? Well, uh, I think takeout and delivery alcohol is a way to make some extra revenue during this very difficult time for those restaurants that are open. A lot of my constituents have seen their favorite restaurants and bars close over the last few weeks. It's very sad to walk along Bleecker Street or in places in Chelsea along 9th Avenue, for example, uh, and on the Upper West Side where I represent, and to see just row after row, store after store, restaurant after restaurant shuttered. So I've introduced legislation that would allow restaurants to continue their takeout and delivery alcohol scheme for two years after the pandemic is over. I hope we can get some traction on that bill. It would involve community board and municipal input, but I think it would really, Darren, extend a very essential lifeline out to these small businesses during this incredibly different, difficult time. We wanna see these restaurants come back. They employ a lot of people. They are the mainstay of many of our blocks here uh, in Manhattan. And uh, they're, like, they're like old friends who, who you wanna see back as soon as possible. Yeah, hey, give us a little bit, because you, you you're, you're asking uh, legislation to amend uh, section 593 of the labor law. and. Uh, that would make sure that no New Yorkers disqualified from receiving uh, unemployment insurance for taking health precautions during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So share with us a little bit about that. Well, 
So the notion there is kind of inspired by what's been happening across the country where there's been a lot of pressure for businesses to reopen. And what I'm concerned about and what my colleagues are concerned about is that they'll reopen and put their employees at risk. No worker should have to go to a workplace that is unsafe or unsanitary or might risk their health. So this would give an option for workers to say, no, my health's more important. I'm not working there and I still want to file for unemployment insurance. Now, my legislation has been incorporated since then into a larger unemployment bill um, that is being put forward by Senator Andrew Gernardis. So I'm hopeful we can pass that soon up in Albany. Yeah, yeah. And uh, talking about Albany, a lot of challenges up there. I'll come back to Albany in a second. Talk to me a little bit more about uh, New York City. Well, Albany and New York City have had their conversations about the transit system. I, I know that you're a proponent of wanting that 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week transit system uh, and wanting full subway service. Uh, give us a little bit about that, uh, because we know that the the transit system was supposed to shut down for sanitization, but you're calling for a 24-7 service. Yes. Well, I'm, uh, you know, alarmed at the fact that for the first time in 115 years, we no longer have 24-7 subway service a lot of essential workers a lot of working class new yorkers a lot of new yorkers use that subway during the off hours that's what makes our city so unique it's a real selling point our mass transit system you know for residents and for businesses that want to locate here i'm concerned that when the pandemic is over we're going to slide into new rationales for keeping the subway system uh operating at reduced hours like revenue uh, for example. And so my bill would call for, at the very least, a vote of the MTA board and the board of New York City Transit in order to keep, um, you know, the subway service suspended. Uh, that's the very least what we owe New Yorkers is a public hearing on that incredibly important question. Yeah, yeah. And um, when I think about, you know, New Yorkers and traveling on the subway, of course, a lot of people travel from day to day doing their work. Um, but then New York was also the site for tourists. And we know that tourism has definitely been affected, uh, particularly your area. You talk about Bleecker Street. I mean, when people come to New York, they come downtown. They're taking a look around around that part. How do you see tourism playing out uh, post coronavirus? Well, you know, I think we have to get our health back first. The health back in the Bronx, in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Manhattan, everywhere. Um, we and then from the health we can start to build our businesses but we can take steps now to support mm -hmm. those small businesses uh to support our restaurants our bars which are the mainstay you know i represent times square too the entire theater district and lincoln center and the public theater so you know what's the future of arts i mean that is a big question because you know congregating is essential to going to see a broadway show um, and that's a shared experience that we may not see for some time. So we need to consider how we can safely reopen Broadway, uh, but it's going to be a while before we're at that point. It's number four on the phased reopenings. I do think there are some reopenings that might happen sooner than mm -hmm. phase four in the arts and culture. And one of those is museums. Um, you've been to museums where they have time tickets and uh, they let, you know, people in at a certain amount of time. Maybe there's no seating. Maybe they have people cleaning, you know, the areas um, after a certain number of visitors. I think we can manage that. So I'm going to make the case at some point that we can move museums ahead of, uh, say, Broadway shows from phase four to maybe phase three. You, but, think, museums, you, think, you think museums can actually work? I, I think I think we're already doing museums in a time ticketing fashion. You know, we they have electronic um uh, surveillance uh in a way that allows limited numbers of people in already the governor's allowing congregations of 10 people or fewer so while it may not be you know a huge revenue generator for museums um i think that they could allow folks to trickle in uh, in a manner that is safe and uh you know adheres to the governor's uh orders that's not true probably for broadway shows Having a Broadway show at 25% capacity is probably a loss leader for them. Uh, so, 
you know, I think that's going to be a longer conversation, unfortunately. And, you know, hopefully with the numbers dropping, hospitalizations, um, intubations, um, cases of uh, active COVID-19, you know, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. I am concerned, like a lot of New Yorkers, about a second wave. So we all have to, you know, continue to wear our face masks, wash our hands and socially distance. We're doing it. And we're beating the virus. Um, every yeah. night at seven o'clock, I have a bullhorn that I yell out of my 15th story apartment to say that very message that, you know, we're defeating the virus because of a collective effort. That's very inspiring for me as a New Yorker. Um, but it's a tough slog. And on a day like Memorial Day, when we all should be out, you know, with our friends uh, cooking uh, out, um, you know, we're indoors. So, it's um it's difficult there's no doubt and i think about you know i think about darren the 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 individual the family uh they may be unemployed uh they may have sickness or death uh in their in their life they may be homeschooling their kids you know because of the uh distance learning um and they may be worried about paying their rent and getting evicted can you imagine that perfect storm well i'm sure you can because it's not that uncommon our- yeah, it's not. It's not. And really, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people are trying to deal with what we call this this storm and this virus and, you know, trying to navigate. But, Senator, thank you so much for the time of sharing. I think that uh, for a lot of us here, uh, we all share the same concern, uh, progression and also caution. Thanks a lot for being with us here on Open. Thanks, Darren. And I just want if I could add just one more thing that mm-hmm. the Senate and Assembly had a hearing on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on minority communities. And that's going to be a conversation that we need to drill down on as we emerge from the virus. What are the systemic racial inequalities that have led to COVID-19 having this devastating, devastating impact uh, on black and brown people? I'm as the Judiciary Committee chair, it's something I'm going to be focused on with my colleagues my Senate colleagues in particular from the Bronx. Have you back on the show and we'll talk more about it. Senator Holyman, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. All right, listen, we want you to stay with us. We do have more open coming up. We'll be right back right after this. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working in spite of and in the face of the dangers. We can count on them. And to keep them working and funded now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 census at my2020census.gov. here with you as we continue our coverage uh, talking about COVID-19 and how it is actually affecting New Yorkers. And uh, New York and federal governments have also issued some laws that are granting immunity for liability for negligence when it comes to healthcare providers and pharmaceutical manufacturers. However, the immunity does not cover misconduct or negligence, and uh, it would cover harm that comes from a shortage in staffing or protective equipment. And as always, we bring our legal analyst, David Lesh, in to join us. He's also the host of today's verdict. And uh, David, good to have you, brother. Uh, always good to be here, Darren. You know, this nursing home fiasco, um, which is really the epicenter of the coronavirus in New York, has brought on a tremendous debate. Um, about two weeks ago, Governor Cuomo finally acknowledged that the nursing homes were no longer going to take any patients from any hospitals before the hospitals checked to make sure that the patient was not um, COVID-19. And 
That probably should have been done at least a month, maybe a month and a half ago. But now we know that you as a hospital cannot release a patient to a nursing home unless that patient has been cleared. Many people said, well, you know, you could have released these patients a month, month and a half ago to vacant buildings where they could have all been on the same floor together if they all had COVID-19. They didn't do that. Um, a, lot of pe a lot of people feel that that in itself um, is grounds for a lawsuit. Well, Governor Cuomo, knowing this, created a, what's called a qualified immunity. It's a limited immunity. And basically what it means is you will not be able to bring an action against a nursing home for the result of a death of a loved one unless you can show that there's gross negligence, a willful misconduct, reckless. It's a very high threshold. And it basically will protect the nursing homes because the nursing homes can say, hey, it's not our fault. They were released by the, by, the, um, by the hospital. How did we know that they were COVID-19? We, did, we didn't know for certain. Um, and to be quite honest with you, we were short-staffed. Essential workers were just starting to be known as to who they were. Um, so you can't bring an action against us. Well, what would be considered gross negligence or what would be considered willful? Maybe allowing staff members in that they knew were infected, or they mm -hmm. should have done some type of screening themselves. That would be gross negligence. That that would be maybe almost willful. That could rise to that level. But, but can we, I, I want to just jump in here for a minute and talk about families for a minute, because as the governor has increased that threshold, and it does protect nursing homes, and it does protect uh, you know them. On the other side, if you're a family and you're experiencing some challenges, it looks like from a family's perspective, you got a major uphill battle in order to make this happen. Well, you and, do. And you bring in a legal action. You do, but nursing, there are, nursing homes are different. They're different. There are different nursing homes out there. Some nursing homes have taken this, some precautions. Some nursing homes may not have. Some nursing homes may not have had enough staff. Some nursing homes may have allowed staff to come in knowing that they tested positive. For COVID-19, just because they needed people to come in and do the shifts, that would be willful. That would be reckless. That would be gross negligence. You would be able to have an action with respect to that type of issue. Now, some states have gone farther, Darren. They've actually issued what's called a sovereign immunity. That means total immunity. No gross negligence, no reckless, just you can't bring an action against a nursing home or somewhere else. That's called mm -hmm. sovereign immunity. We didn't do that here. We did what's called qualified immunity. So qualified immunity will basically shield the nursing homes to an extent. So you have to understand that if you do think that your loved one passed away and there was gross negligence, not just negligence, gross negligence, you probably would be able to bring an action. And there are attorneys out there who are creating class actions so that, you know, one plaintiff will be the, the head of the class and they go against a group of the nursing homes, which by the way are private. These are private mm. nursing homes. This isn't public. These nursing homes are in the business of making money. So it's very, very important that you understand what your rights are when it comes to this. And it's all unfolding and you're gonna have a time to do this because the yeah. statute of limitations will still be three years. But it, you definitely want to get as much, as many records as you can get and patient mm -hmm. files as you can to protect yourself, which leads me, by the way, to an interesting interview that I just recently did for the Gothamist. Yeah, let me, let, me, let, me jump, let me jump in because I want to, let me, let me lead in and how about that one. Uh, but I do want to talk about that because as David's getting ready to talk about uh, an interview that you did talking about basically another lawsuit that deals with false imprisonment, right? Uh, <laughs> That's right. Under and and, that, and it, it, it's related. To the nursing home issue because it, it goes to whether or not you would be able to bring an action. What's the threshold for a, a set of facts? And th these facts are different. What if there's contact tracing? They find out for certain that you are COVID-19 positive, And now the city, the state says you must stay in. You have to be quarantined and they don't let you out. And that happens in certain places. You could be in a certain halfway home. You could be in um. 
you, you could be in a homeless shelter. You could be in a place where they said you're not allowed to leave. Literally can't leave. Now, now that the time is up, the 14 days, and you want to bring an action for false imprisonment. Your mental state has, has been horrendous during the 14 days. It's contributed to a psychiatric condition. You've been falsely imprisoned, just as if you're falsely arrested and imprisoned mm. for 14 days. You're in prison. Well, here's the thing. Yes, the law seems to suggest that you can, again, if it's reckless and willful. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's say your particular group, your ethnicity, your religion has been targeted. Only the Orthodox, you know, only the African American community, only the Latino community. They've been targeted so that that they, your the your group has been forced to stay in if you've been tested positive. We see you at religious um, functions in Brooklyn. Therefore, we're going to find out where you are and we're going to quarantine you. Just you, just the Orthodox Jews, just this this particular group in Harlem, or just someplace else. That would be willful. That would be reckless. You would be able to bring an action there. So I think we could see that in the future. I, I, and that's what, that's what the Gothamist really was asking me questions about. They weighed in with a, with a professor from Fordham as well, constitutional law. It's, this is an interesting time. Many, many of our governments are trying to shield themselves from potential lawsuits, and they are coming, Darren. I mean, we have 100,000 people have died in this country. You can't tell me it's all an accident and all nothing could have been done to have prevented it. There are, right. Lawsuits will be here for decades. And right. the, question, the question is, what's the threshold that a lawyer has to has to meet? To be well, let me, to bring yeah, and, and let me ask this question. When you talk about a lawsuit, right, we understand that if a lawsuit is brought against the state, obviously the state has to pay that lawsuit, insurance companies are going to pay that lawsuit. We know that the state is already broke as it is. We've been hearing that from time and time again. So is increasing the threshold, making these higher thresholds, a way of not just protecting nursing homes, but actually a way of protecting the state? Because that's what a lot of people feel like. The state is going to do everything that it has to do in order to protect itself from making sure that they're not paying out anymore because they spend a lot of money on ventilators, much needed, but how much more can one state be able to handle and those lawsuits would just cripple? That's right. Well, that's true. And that's the other side of it. And that's why they're saying you can sue only if it's gross, gross negligence, really reckless and willful behavior. Just negligence? No. You know, you, you, didn't, you didn't buy enough ventilators. You, you didn't realize it. It, wasn't, it, was, it was really more negligent because you thought the shipment was coming from one place, but it came from the other place, but you made it the effort to get the ventilators in. Well, wouldn't that just be negligent? It's negligent. You, you should have realized it, but it wasn't willful. It wasn't, I don't care. We have enough ventilators. What, you know what? They'll share what they have. You know what? They'll make use of it. One ventilator for three people. We'll make it work. Mm -hmm. that would be willful. That wouldn't be negligence. But you're right. It comes from taxpayer money if it's the city or the state. We don't want to waste that money. We need that money for so many other things. Private insurance companies, well, you know, that's what you insure, you know, institutions for, uh, private nursing homes for, for their negligence. But will they cover them for gross negligence, willful, reckless? Maybe not. So there may not mm -hmm. even be money there to cover them to begin with. I don't take right. it in my office where a lot, many times they don't take cases where insurance isn't there because it's very difficult to actually get the money in the pockets of my client. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, a lot, a lot to think about. Listen, I got less than a minute, but I want to ask you this question. Talk about court systems. What are we hearing in terms of opening back up? I know that, you know, you've got, a, you've got an administrative judge that's actually handling business on a day-to-day -day fashion. What are we right. hearing by way of courts? You know, it's funny. I started with you. You know, when we first went into lockdown, I remember you in my first interview that I did, and I told you we were doing remote at home. Well, since that time, we've been doing a lot of virtual depositions. I Even many, you know, um, summary jury trials we've been doing. I've had virtual conferences all day long. And it looks like, from what I hear, somewhere around June 15th, judges will be reporting back to their courthouses where they will actually be mandated to, to actually be there, not just some judges who are doing conferences. So it looks like June 15th, things are starting again, Darren, but that doesn't mean we're going to get 100 lawyers in the courtroom anymore. They're right. going to be facing things out. This is freely flowing. You know, 
up in, you know, where you are up in, or in, in different places upstate. It's like the test model and we're going to see how it goes. And then from there, Bronx County is going to take a look at it and we're going to start implementing it in the next couple of weeks. That's, that's the word on the street. Well, that's the, well we, are, we have to leave it with the word on the street. We've got the word from David Lesh as well. Right. Uh, our buddy, uh, host of today's verdict and also our legal analyst, analyst here on uh, Open. David, thank you so much for being with us. All right. It's my pleasure as always, Aaron. You stay safe. Hey, you stay safe too, buddy. All right, listen, everybody, stay tuned. We still have more show here on Open. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back right after this. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And welcome back. Well, imagine, what if we could actually stomp out hunger one slice at a time? Well, what if we could help feed our hardworking people who've actually worked in the healthcare community during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the not-for-profit organization Slice Out Hunger is doing just that. I want to take you down to WFUV's news director, George Badowski, who talked with founder Scott Weiner as part of our BronxNet collection, I should say connections collaboration. We're going to take a look at that right now. I'm George Bolodarki. I'm the news director of WFUV. That's the NPR affiliate station based on the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University in the Bronx. I'm coming to you as part of our collaboration with BronxNet called Bronx Connections. Now, what if we could stomp out hunger one slice of pizza at a time? Or what if we could help to feed our hardworking healthcare community that's working so hard right now during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, enter Scott Weiner and the founder of an organization called Slice Out Hunger. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So what is Slice Out Hunger? We are a nonprofit organization based here in New York City, but with a spread around the rest of the country. We produce campaigns and events that are all pizza related and they they raise awareness and funds for hunger relief organizations all over the country. So how do these events work typically? Well usually we have a pizza party event where everybody might show up in one spot. We have multiple pizzerias there and they serve slices that we charge a dollar per slice. And then all the money we raise from those goes to Food Bank for New York City or City Harvest or Sylvia Center or some group that helps support hunger relief. Uh, but lately, things have changed a little bit since we can't have large groups gather. So how are you operating during the pandemic? Well, we have one major campaign that started at the end of March, along with the uh, incursion of the pandemic. It's called Pizza versus Pandemic. It's basically a funds drive that we use the funding that we take in on our website to buy pizza from independent pizzerias to be sent to hospitals all across the country. So on our website, there's a donation platform. There's also a hospital recommendation platform. So you can write in the name of a hospital. We then take that, verify it as a source, and then we send them pizza. As long as we have funds in the bank, that's what we do. How has that campaign been going? It's been astronomical. We've raised over a half a million dollars wow. in the last seven or eight weeks. We've sent 23,000 pizzas to over 1,100 hospitals. Wow, that's quite the impact. Yeah, it's been really huge. It, you know, in the years that we've been operating, we've done great things here and there. 
but nothing has been such a big, fast moving uh, campaign as this. And I think it's because everybody's so concerned. You wanna do something to help, but the best thing we can do for the rest of the country is to stay home. So how can you help from home? You can make a donation, you can volunteer for us and make phone calls to hospitals. I mean, there's tons of ways to help. We've all seen that uh, fundraising has been, has been really positive over the past few weeks. So many great organizations have been able to do serious work and it's extremely necessary work. And because so many people have been hit by this, we're all hit by it. So sending a donation and sending a couple of pizzas to a hospital uh, really makes uh, the hospitals feel great. It's good business for the pizzerias. And it also helps us feel like we're doing something and not just sitting at home on the couch. Now, I understand that pizza sales have actually been going through the roof during the pandemic. It's one of the most ordered foods for takeout and delivery. Yeah, when we started this, uh, pizzerias were really hit hard and they were, a lot of them were closed and it was in that first week or so when people were just closed. And then of course it's taken off because it's such an easily delivered food. Uh, you're cooking it in a really hot oven. So there's not so much of a, of a problem there with something like raw foods or uncooked foods. So it's been really interesting to see in situations like this, pizza usually is the standby. It's a comfort food. It's a delivery food. You certainly can't stop pizza when it comes to a situation like this. Now you, sir, are all about pizza. You are also the owner of a great tour company here in New York City, Scott's Pizza Tours. Yep. <laughs> pizza is my entire life, that's for sure. What is it about pizza that you love so much? You know, it's just, it's the, it's the thing that you can't help but love. Like, you might feel indifferent about food, but when it comes to pizza, everybody's got an opinion. And, and it's because you grow up with it. There's an emotional attachment to it. It's probably the first thing that I know I use my own money to buy. Uh, first food I ever bought for myself. And so pizza is just, it's, it's always there for you. It's, a, it's fun. It's positive. What's not to love? And tell us about your tours. Yeah, the tours are really fun. We go, uh, usually when we can be there in person, we take people into pizzerias, into the kitchens, teach them about the ovens, cheese selection, tomato preparation. It's really deep and in-depth and, uh, and historically driven. There's a lot of history that we talk about. And now that we're in a physical distant arena, we've been doing tons of great online pizza making classes and pizza history classes and uh, we've got a great sort of virtual tour that we call New York City in Eight Slices. It's really fun. We take people through all the boroughs and explain what pizzerias are really important and uh, how there's a lot you can do even from home. I'm sure it might be difficult for you to answer this question, but what is your favorite pizza place? <sighs> Oof, that, is, that is the question, isn't it? I don't have a single personal favorite. But lately, I've been dreaming of getting back to Joe's and uh, Lindry and Scars and Patsy's. I mean, Louie and Ernie's in the Bronx, Pugsley's in the Bronx. I mean, I have so many favorites. Danny's in Queens, uh, Luigi's in Park Slope, Joe and Pass in Staten Island, Ruby Rose in Manhattan. I mean, like, I haven't been to pizzerias in eight weeks. This is the longest I've ever gone without being in a pizzeria by far. I was going to ask you about pizza in the Bronx, and you named a couple there, including Pugsley's, which is right in my backyard at Fordham University. I love Sal and Pina and Pete so much, and the fact that I haven't seen them in this long, it's really, it's really sad. But yeah, Pugsley's, oh, so good. And Louie and Arnie's, and then there's, uh, what's it called, Tommy's? There's uh, so many good places in the Bronx, come on. <laughs> How long ago did you found Slice Out Hunger? Slice Out Hunger unofficially launched in 2009, and then we became a 501c3 in 2015. And the website, once again? Sliceouthunger.org, or if you want to go directly to this campaign, it's pandemic.pizza. And your website for people who want to check out your virtual tours and then look forward to some real in-person tours. Yeah, you can go to scottatours.com. We actually just launched a brand new website last week. 
So really easy to find our virtual events there. We do pizza making on the weekends and we do a lecture series during the week. So really good stuff happening there. You can have a good time and visually eat pizza while, while being at home isolated. Scott, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Really good to see you, George. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. And thank you, George and Scott. Of course, we've got more open. We want you to stay with us. More show coming up. We'll be right back in a few. most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. And welcome back here to Open. Darren Jaime here with you. Perfect Piece of the Puzzle Incorporated is a not-for-profit organization that's actually assisting families on their journey to find appropriate programs for special needs children. Uh, they offer guidance to families who are overwhelmed with the process and also provide support to finding the necessary resources. And so the question is, how is this organization doing during the pandemic. And so we're pleased to be joined by Trisha Bermudez, who shares a little bit with us now here on Open. And Trisha, good to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. So as we talk about navigating COVID-19, everybody's trying to navigate and everybody's been affected. Talk to us about how you guys are making uh, do and making the adjustments in this season. I'm kind of being creative right now. Uh, we had a brunch initially planned for the end of, of March, which honors uh, parents of children with disabilities um, because we tend to put ourselves last and never really giving ourselves time to um, relax um, because we're always on, we're always either advocating or taking care of our children or um, figuring out next steps. And uh, so with that, our kind of plan had to shift a little bit, uh, being that, you know, mid-March, everything kind of uh, was on a pause and uh, we are all on a, the adult version of timeout. <laughs> so for, uh, for that, we had to become a little bit creative because a lot of it became uh, frustration for parents, not knowing how to move, what the future plans were and, um, the, the guidance was, was there, but didn't really include uh, children with disabilities. And um, so with that, uh, out of my frustration for that, I started a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, my, my little one, um, I'm a single mom. So at the end of the day, yeah. everything becomes uh, mom, a multitask. Yeah, yes, I'm a single mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, being frustrated by my own circumstance and knowing that, you know, this journey is about not being the only one um, going through the same thing, uh, I created a podcast. Uh, initially, the podcast was named At Home with Trisha because, again, we're all at home. And um, right. it was just me and, and kind of recapping our first week going through Mommy. Um, Mommy. remote learning. Yes, sir. Mommy. Party. <laughs> um, yes, baby. <laughs> that's listen. That's what happens when you know we we're at home. I mean, there's a whole lot of adjustments we have to make, and there's some things that we have to do to really navigate. And we can't abandon what really is. And you know, we, we're navigating our children. We're trying to make it happen. And you know, as you said, you're finding the pieces to the puzzle in your own kind of way. 
right right i mean this is really what it is it's it's kind of <laughs> shifting and moving as things happen and and you can't really plan for much of anything and even when you plan the plans get uh a, a little wrench in it but then you gotta readjust so i mean he's he's no stranger <laughs> right right um so the the podcast kind of uh has now evolved i have co-hosts yes ma'am. Mm-hmm. A pat and he's very familiar with the podcast even though he's usually sleeping right um the podcast now has uh maria. i have three other co-hosts maria. one being maria mm-hmm. uh, maria liriano she's from the bronx okay. she has a son on the spectrum as well he's uh he's in district 10 mm-hmm. uh, another co-host is gloria corsino she's also in the bronx and she has uh three sons two of which are are on the on the spectrum as well and we have ellen McHugh, who's um a veteran in this industry uh of of advocacy and she has a older son that is um uh uh deaf uh so she has much more experience in it she also works for parents and parent of new york state and brings to the podcast a plethora of experience going back um 40 years because that's how how old her son is and so the podcast has varying uh topics based on you know the things that happen throughout um remote learning uh from parents coping to uh teletherapy and understanding that uh oh listening to the podcast you even hear us break down i think i had one of the worst breakdowns when since starting the podcast um i call it my my spiraling moment to my implosion um because it's it's i mean at the end of the day it's real it's things that we're going through and experiencing and realizing how to readjust moving forward um the podcast brings to you anecdotes or or even we ended on a, a high note. So our aha moment or our um, funny moment for the past week. And we tried to make it where parents can listen in and hear that there are other parents going through the same circumstances as well as um, being able to even share with us what they experience as well throughout this whole remote learning experience. Uh, we started a, a survey kind of pooling and finding out where parents are right now with remote learning and how they, they want us to help kind of push. So and let me ask you for people uh, who may want to jump before I jump out uh, and ask you about people want to get connected, right? Because certainly the podcast is great and the services that you're offering are still going on and, uh, people may say, listen, you know, I want to get connected to the podcast. I want to get connected to what you're doing. So how can they go about doing that? So you can find the podcast on Podbean. Uh, you can definitely go to our website, perfectpop.org uh, slash podcast. And um, you'll have a link to all our previous podcasts on there, as well as a sub link to various resources that we've, we've posted Um as well as the current questionnaire that we have posted for parents to answer and fill out. Um, That's also on there. We're looking to release another kind of questionnaire geared towards teachers. Because at this point, um, you know, the teachers are our allies and they're also in the the trenches with us. And we want to be able to, once whatever coming out of this looks like, we want to be able to, to have a step up or a step ahead um in in the whatever the return looks like and we want to hear from teachers and helping them get get back into whatever groove um or or providing them with whatever supports they need it to be successful in in a return okay well trisha bermuda is from perfect piece of the puzzle we want to thank you so much for coming and sharing with us best wishes with the podcast and uh definitely take care of that little one and we'll uh get back to you soon thanks so much for being with us here on open Thank you so much. All righty. Trisha Bermuda is our guest here. Perfect piece of the puzzle incorporated. We want you to stay with us. We do have more open coming up. We're coming right back right after this.
we're coming out of the other side. So in many ways, from my point of view, we're on the other side of the mountain. You have to be New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving. This is the next big step in this historic journey. We talk about being New York tough and what tough really means. We change the trajectory dramatically by what we did. What we have done thus far is really amazing. And that was smart, but we have to stay smart. And welcome back to here to open. Darren Jaime here with you. Well, COVID-19 has affected a lot of people across the United States, here particularly in New York, business. And when we talk about business, small businesses being affected. One of those small businesses are actually barbershops. Barbershops have still yet to been phased into uh, the recovery effort of reopening. Uh, they have not yet opened their doors. And yet and still, many are still left to struggle and some even left to close their doors. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about the whole tension of how to reopen and how to stay open is Dennis Mitchell. Dennis Mitchell is the owner of Denny Moe's Superstar Barbershop in Harlem, New York. And uh, Denny Moe, good to have you, brother. Oh, man, thanks for having me on, man. Hey, listen, glad to have you. So when we talk about this now, um, give us a little bit about this. The doors closed for you, uh, and after the doors closed for you, uh, certainly... Uh, your business got to the place of literally being in jeopardy. Absolutely. Um, the day the doors closed, it was, um, it, it didn't hit me right away because of the simple fact that I figured, okay, this, something is going to happen. We're going to basically, you know, just open up in a couple of weeks or whatever. And then a month went by and then two months has gone by. And um, then now you start thinking, wow, what, what are we going to do? You know, because um, there's no revenue being brought in, no money whatsoever. You know what I mean? No money being made. So, and the, um, you know, the, the people still asking for their rent. The con is still asking for their utility bills. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, something's got to give. So now you, now you, now you, it's set, the, the reality of it sets in. And now you're on the roller coaster. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're on the roller coaster of emotions. You know, I told somebody that the other day, asked me what, what part of the roller coaster was I on right now? <laughs> I told yeah. you, I'm on the loop de loop right now. Because <laughs> you, know, uh, you know it plays it plays um, it plays with your emotions a lot, man. And you try to you try to not think about it too much. And then when you're in the middle of you know enjoying yourself, enjoying your family, to everybody laughing, smiling, having a good time, and then all of a sudden, boom, it kicks in and takes you all takes you totally away from it. You know what I mean? From what yeah. you're doing at that moment. But just um just just. Like I said on my video, I, I filled out um, a few applications. I uh, was denied a couple, but um, I I have, you know, firm belief that the uh, disaster will come through, you know. Um, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that because that will help, you know, take care of all the, all the bills. Yeah, you're talking about that disaster relief loan. And for our viewers that don't know, uh, you know, in the midst of all your trouble, uh, you actually launched a GoFundMe to actually help uh, you. And for people who don't know, your, your barbershop's located right in the center of Harlem. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we talk about those who've been strictly affected or predominantly affected are communities of color by COVID-19, by uh, both mortality and then also chronic diseases. So you got a lot of things that's working against you, but yet and still that GoFundMe that you actually put up actually began to work for you. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I... I, I, it's something about it's something about it. Whenever I do things, whenever I say I'm going to do certain things, and um, I go for the uh, you know the, the the deep pocket, which is the government, the state, the city, and um, they they failed me. You know, not just now, but in the, in the in the past. You know, and when they failed me, I reach out to my community, and I don't know, man. For some reason, they always hold me up. You know what I mean? The community holds me up. You see what the, see what my sweater says. Yeah, you see that? Yes, sir. UCLA, uh huh. University on the corner of Lennox Avenue. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, right. So I mean, you know, it's it's just it's just a good thing to. So, 
being a good person and being good in your community, being the friendly neighborhood barber, you know, people people take to you. And, and whenever they see you in distress, they come to your aid, you know, and, and that's what they've done. They come to my well, aid. Well, I know that, listen, for you, you've done a thing called Cuts for uh, cuts for Cutting for a Cure. You've mm -hmm. done some work where you've actually, uh, actually did 24-hour cuts around the clock uh, to support raising money for cancer. For yeah, for free. And right. then you turn around now and you get yourself in a situation, well, not you got yourself in a situation, but COVID-19 forces that situation for you to have to be able to let's navigate. Right. What's it like for you to have the community be able to respond back to you when you've been out there and you've kicked it for the community in so many different ways? Well, you know, it, it's, 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 it's unbelievable, man. And it's not, it's not, let me rephrase that. It's not unbelievable. It's, it's beautiful because um, just when you think no one is paying attention, you know, and something like this happens and everybody comes out for you and you say, wow, they paid attention. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm grateful for my community, totally grateful. And that's why I do the things that I do with Cutting for a Cure and back to school drives and toy drives and stuff like that, clothing drives, because I know we're needy people. We're in a, we, our, our community it is, um, you know, underserved. And um, I just want to be a part of um, uplifting, you know, the community. And I do that. And in return for me being, you know, uh, visually in, in the community, people are not uplifting Denny Moss. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I'm, 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 I'm really grateful for that, you know. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's about um, community. Community means a group of people coming together for one common cause, you know. Right. And um, that's, what they, they, that's what they're doing. They're coming together so Denny Moss can survive. Now, hopefully, you know, that the pandemic doesn't go too, too much further. Because if they go too right. further, you know, we're, we're going to have to get back on the grind and try to get some more money and, and um, try to sustain. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of businesses that are um, smaller, my size or a little even bigger, that are going out of business. And that's the reality. That's the, the gut punch when you drive by and you see that the, um, that the uh, gym is gone. Right. The treadmills are out of the window. I, I, I'm driving by the, the gym and I'm saying, I can't wait to get back in the gym. And then I drive by the next day and the gym is gutted out. Yeah. And yeah. just driving around here, just driving around Harlem and not even, not even talking about downtown, but driving around Harlem, man, there's a lot of things closing up and they're, you know, not coming back, you know? And yeah. I, I know a lot of churches are going to be hurt by it. And a lot of, you know, just like you said, small businesses are going to be devastated. You know? Yeah. Well, we know we know that you're coming back in June and you're reopening in June, and I'm glad to hear how the community is coming. Really rally behind. Then we'll put out a you know a GoFundMe for about twenty five thousand dollars, and the community actually responded back. Then Mo, congratulations on the great work, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hey man, I look forward to it. All right, Dennis Mitchell, who is the. Uh, the owner of Denny Mose. If you want to find out more about him, go to his website at www.dennymoe.com. Well, that about wraps it up for this edition of Open. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for watching. Now, if you want, you can catch any part of the show. If you missed any part, I should say, of the show, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 8 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, that would be Channel 33 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, we thank you for watching. My girl Rita Valentine will be back on Friday with a brand new, fresh episode of Open. Until then, stay safe, God bless, and we'll talk to you soon.